So tonight's conversation is going to be about Carey's diagnosis normalization. We had been throwing around the term calibration. Um, I like the term normalization because we are trying to normalize how different providers see things like this lesion here on the radiograph. So today's goal is to objectify the often subjective process of Carey's diagnosis on bite wing radiographs. Uh, part of this has come from years of hygienists being frustrated, and rightfully so, with different doctors, me being one of those doctors, that come in and don't agree on things like this. So we really want to create a process where it doesn't matter what doctor goes in, we all agree. Now obviously we have different levels of training, we have different influences as time goes on, uh, we have different levels of experience which may create certain biases in our interpretation of things like this, but hopefully by the end of tonight, at least for the doctors that, that are here tonight, we have a, a standardized perspective and lens as we take a look at these. So a few housekeeping items. To receive one free ECU from NECAID, you must have your camera on and engaged, uh, texting your um, your mistress or your misters uh, while doing this is not engaged. Um, this is a requirement of my PACE accreditation. It's not me just trying to tell you guys what to do. If you're here, you want to receive this free CE, you know, we ask that you're actually participating in the information being presented. All NECAID credits are PACE approved by the AGD and their main dental board, board approved. If you want to enjoy with the camera off, that is okay too. I won't call on anyone, so if you have your camera on, I won't call on anyone except for maybe Zach and Christian. Um, with that said, participation is strongly encouraged, which is not an expectation. So let's have fun tonight aligning our diagnostic skills. And thank you to Tessa and Dr. Regan, who were two contributors to some of the content that we'll be looking at tonight. So starting here, looking at number 4DO. Um, there's an A and a B. Yeah, this should be A and B. So A is the top one, meaning restore with a class two composite and B, no treatment. Type in A if you would restore this. Type in B if you would not restore this. Do we have any other information? Nothing yet. Like a... <laughs> good, okay. good question. Um, all right, now you can do it. This is so fun. Will no treatment win? This is fun. I knew it was going to be 50 50. Wow. That's pretty good. Look at that. Ooh. Talk about calibrated. <laughs> <laughs> one out of one, one out of two doctors will agree. How is this feeling that this is proving your point? We need this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't know how this was going to turn out. It reminds me of the, the last time the Patriots won the Super Bowl, Good Morning America, they had the pigs race where they had. I don't know, two different pigs. I don't know if you guys saw that, but it was rather comical. The uh, the pig that won was the Patriots, and it took a, a rather, cir um, what's the word, cir circuitous route <laughs> to get there. All right, so point is, you know, there's no clear consensus here. Obviously, Dr. Greenbaum's right. More information would be helpful. But let's go on. Okay, what about this one? Hold on, let me, I have to activate this. I'm using the free version, so it only lets you do one at a time. All right, go ahead. Would you treat this one? Ryan, we got to show those radiographs from the Vermont dentist. That was eye-opening today. So this one's a little more lopsided. Um, I think we're in more agreement here.
When I went to dental school, this was considered a perfect board lesion. As we're going to discuss today, I think we're going to be surprised about what the literature currently says about something like this. Um, those who recently graduated, uh, I think the board exam is now not patient-based anymore. Regan, was, was this a good board lesion when you went to school? Because I know you had a live patient. That was a board lesion all day. Yeah. Yep. I'm sharing, by the way, nothing I'm going to say tonight is my opinion. I'm going to present the science and I want us to come up with um, our own opinions together, an alignment of opinions. We will always rely on science, not production. I've been in practices where this is a lesion that needs to be treated. That, that is a lesion, but maybe it's not a cavitation. There's a difference between the two we'll go over in a moment, um, simply because it's a production builder or a practice builder. We're going to rely on science. So this is rather obvious. What is the difference between a subjective and objective? Not to demean anybody's intelligence tonight, but this is a rather important thing. We're going to try to objectify things, which is based on actual facts and observations and measurements versus subjective, which is a personal opinion, judgment, feelings, or point of view, which is typically um, influenced greatly by uh, biases. Here's the oral radiology book I had in dental school. I still have it to, to today. Um, one of the comments that they made, lesions uh, confined to the enamel may not be evident radiographically. I mean, we all know this. Sometimes we're not actually seeing the true extent of the lesion. I think a few of you guys are going to try to think, where is he going with this? And then I'm going to swing back in a different direction. But this was interesting. This is out of one of the leading textbooks in oral radiology. Even experienced dentists often do not agree on the presence or absence of caries when examining the same set of radiographs, blah, 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 blah. The possibility of false positive diagnoses of small lesions combined with the knowledge that caries progresses slowly in most individuals argues for a conserv conservative approach to caries diagnosis and treatment. This was back in 2004, I think I bought this book. This was kind of a shift towards this more conservative approach where maybe that board lesion isn't a treatable lesion. Maybe. Interesting, interesting thought. An interesting observation is the fact that on different monitors, we may or may not have different conclusions. I was sharing with one of the doctors recently back in the old building. I, would, I was the only doctor for a period of time. I would treatment plan something, and then I would see it in the, in the other room uh, during treatment day, and I would be pleasantly surprised at the fact that there was nothing there. What changed? The same observer, same set of biases, opinions, and you know, uh, perceived objective observation. Was it the monitor? Was it the fact that my eyesight was a little less acute that day? Point is, there's a lot of variables that go into this. So an important thing, and I know we all know this, this is a video of me um, clicking on a patient. I know it's not a bite wing. The point is, I'm just trying to show how to use the tools that we have within Dexas. I'm clicking on the black here to open up the Dexas software so that we can change the brightness and contrast to get a better sense of what's going on. I get some of this is probably rather straightforward. But with our software, you just hover over the top and you go down, and then you go left and right. It changes the white balance and then the, the, the contrast. So just looking at this guy here, I'm not saying it's a lesion. All I'm saying is you get more information when you change the settings within the software. So doctors, when you go into hygiene exams, you really should be doing this all of the time Obviously, some hygienists are better about not having over and under exposures, uh, but the reality is there is additional information as we make those changes. Recency bias. How the hell does this correlate to what we're talking about tonight? Recency bias is a cognitive bias that favors recent events over historic ones. It's a form of memory bias. Recency bias gives greater importance to the most recent event. It is not uncommon in medicine and dentistry to place greater weight on certain perspectives as a function of what happened and experienced most recently. With respect to today's conversation, a doctor to treatment plan versus quote unquote watch or not treat may very well be influenced by recency bias. What's an example of this? The day before you're looking at a bite wing where you're on the fence whether to recommend treatment or not, maybe the day before you had a lesion that looked just like that 
and the patient had very high caries risk and you went in there and it was blown out. That will have an influence on what you do the next day. And I share this because we're all human. Um, I asked a hygienist to understand that this is part of it. I can't tell you how many times I've gone in a tooth that I swore that I would see decay and I didn't see any decay. I've also gone in there and seen the opposite. It's rather interesting. What we see radiographically is not always what we see clinically. There's not a direct correlation, so there is no perfect answer. But we can objectify the decision making to, to go forward with that. Again, coming back to this image here. So I went in the literature to try to find the best article in a meta-analysis form on this topic, and I found it. This came out of the <clears throat> Community Dentistry and Oral Epidemiology Journal. Uh, essentially, the, the authors of this wanted to look at the different manage, uh, caries management risk assessment tools that are out there. I'm going to talk a little bit about what this is, but they, they put something rather interesting in the abstract here. There has been some limited change in the decision making. So what we're talking about here is when do you actually go in and treat? That's really what the conversation of tonight is. There has been some limited change except in some Scandinavian countries in the models of caries management and reimbursement, which has been heavily skewed towards drilling and filling. Again, I've gone in many teeth and been like, hmm, there was nothing there, even though on the radiograph um, it looked like something I was taught to treat. There is no overall agreement on a caries case definition or when to surgically intervene. This was 2017. This is a very recent um, <clears throat> scouring of the data worldwide. Well, if this is what they found, I have nothing to present tonight is really what it comes down to because there is no answer. But I think we can normalize the, the opinions. Here are the different systems. The International Caries Detection and Assessment System. Again, these are different ways of classifying carious lesions. We're talking about interproximal just tonight. These, each of these systems has an occlusal classification too, which maybe we'll do another night. The International Caries Detection and Assessment System. Canberra. We've all heard about Canberra. That came out about 10 years ago. It was rather popular. It seems to have lost steam. Um, that's using an assessment based upon uh, a risk assessment profile. <coughs> England has the caries management system. I say England, Australia, sorry. The ADA has the uh, caries classification system. I'm actually surprised. I, I didn't find this rather helpful. I actually liked um, this one a little bit better. The normative conventional carry system compiled by the authors of this study. The point is there's different ways of doing that. So which system do we use? I don't know. I'm not going to go into each of the systems. I'm just going to kind of cover the fact that there's many different ways to slice and dice this. What was common amongst most of these? I put DT for diagnosis and treatment systems. <clears throat> They all had modifiers and or environmental factors as an important metric. As we all know, back in 2017, when the periodontal classification came out, <clears throat> um, they treated it more like the cancer classifications, where there are factors that influence whether or not that's a disease process worth treating or not. These factors are diet, oral hygiene frequency and effectiveness, recall frequency, fluoride exposure, so on and so forth. <laughs> So caries risk assessment, this is the, um, the one that comes from the, I believe it's the ADA, denotes the following. The process of establishing the probability of an individual patient developing new carious lesions over the near, near future. So when you're looking at a lesion, this part, potential influence of the risk has to go into the decision making. That's why Dr. Greenbaum so eloquently said, can I have some more information? He's right. Um, the point of me putting that beginning was to try to see what we were going to do moving forward, which is build in the risk. They further go on by saying things like personal data, demographic, employment, level of education, contact information. Like that's going to influence your decision making on carries, but they're advocating that that's what we do. The point is <clears throat> incorporating all of these is very subjective. I don't know, Zach, did they teach you DMFT scores? He had to run to the bathroom. Uh, Sophia, did they talk about DMFT score? 
Um, it yes. was disgust. So when I went to school, it was like the thing that we used to assess risk. It's an acronym for decayed mist and filled teeth, basically the historical perspective. Not very helpful because you can have a patient that had a period of drug use that has a lot of fillings and missing teeth, but their current risk is um, not high. So that was maybe a first attempt at risk analysis. <clears throat> uh, it's not present anymore. Plaque biofilm status. You know, how many of us are actually probing next to a lesion to see if the gum tissues bleed? That actually does happen. I know this is not something that uh, happens regularly, uh, but it is something important to talk about. So then we have the staging. This is when we're getting a little bit more um, in line with tonight's topic. Here we have E1, E2, D1, D2, D3. This is the classification system we're most likely to uh, have been taught. Do know there's many, of, there's many systems out there uh, worldwide, but they're relatively the same. This is really the one where most of the focus and attention is. Actually, these two, E2 and D1. What do you do with these? <laughs> I think we're all in agreement we would do these. Um, I know dentists that would do that one, but this is the gray area where I think most of us are gonna have a variety of opinions. Here's a great textbook on the topic. We could talk about affected versus infected dentin. I don't think we're gonna have to go about that, but here's the, the chart that the ADA carries classification uh, came out with. So here at the top they have, <clears throat> this is, um, degree of progression of the lesion. Again, it's not talking about whether it's cavitated, cavitated or not. We can't tell if it's cavitated simply by a radiograph alone. Um, you can have demineralization but not necessarily build up a bacteria. But the point is there's a progression here. Uh, here they talk about the cavitation process, so on and so forth. But we're looking down here, so let's skip over the, the occlusal and the um, smooth surface caries. <clears throat> and I want to focus on this one right here. I was rather surprised that they put this under the initial. As we will see, their treatment recommendation for this lesion in a low-risk patient is to watch it. I learned something by putting this together, as I always do. I probably would have treated that one, at least in a maybe a moderate risk patient with other caries. Uh, maybe if that was the only lesion in a, in a patient with low risk, I probably, probably wouldn't have treated it. That's an interesting observation, and this is kind of the trend now. We're going towards a much more conservative model in treating these lesions. So what are the treatment recommendations from these categories? So here, the Canberra model says, for lesions confined to the enamel, chemical treatment, mostly through the use of fluoride or preventative maintenance is recommended. That first lesion that we talked about, 50% uh, of us said we would treat it. According to Canberra, which is a rather well-studied risk management um, recommendation protocol, we don't treat those. Again, I'm just sharing the literature. I'm not telling you my opinion. <laughs> the ADA classification, management of initial caries. The word initial is the important one. Let's go back here. Initial, D1 lesion is an initial lesion. Let's see what their recommendation is. Lesion, um, depending upon the lesion extent, lesion location, so on and so forth, a risk-adjusted treatment decision for non-surgical or surgical intervention may be made by the patient with the provider. The indicated treatment for initial lesions will most frequently be non-surgical. Ah, okay. It's definitely a paradigm shift. Who knew this? Anybody want to chime in about this? This is not what I was taught. Kevin, Kevin Connolly's on this call. He and I were taught from the same era. This is sure as hell not what we were taught. But here we have the ADA making a very bold statement that maybe we watch those D1s. So risk factor determination. How do we build in the risk factors? There are many different opinions here. There's no agreement whatsoever. There is no definitive tool for modifying treatment recommendations according to risk factors. The point is, I don't know how objective we're gonna get. 
So I put this together thinking I was going to have a nice fancy flow chart at the end for everybody, uh, mostly for myself because I want to show up well for the hygienists. And <clears throat> I don't think we're going to get there in great part because there is no consensus agreement in the literature. Therefore, we cannot objectify this part of the caries diagnostic process at this time. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> So here's a snapshot from that article that I brought up earlier. <clears throat> and I think this is the best 10,000 foot view diagram that I've seen so far on this particular topic. What it, did, what it does, it stratifies them based upon um, lesion progression and then patient risk and then gives a recommendation accordingly. Again, lesion size initial E1 to E2 According to this, they call D1 a moderate. This is a little bit different. <clears throat> C1, D1 here in the, in the ADA classification, they call that initial. I'm a little more comfortable with this here. Have I, have I gone in le with lesions like this and been surprised that I didn't actually see anything more than just stained dentin? Yeah, but more often than not, that's a true cavity. In other words, I break through the enamel, put the Explorer in there and it's nice and soft. I won't say nice and soft, but it's soft. So <clears throat> this is the beginning of what I think we're going to use in the practices. Print them out, have them in all the operatories as a way to standardize or normalize how we're viewing these different things. This is my presentation. I want a discussion about this as we move forward because I want to see how others, other opinions go on out there. So what are everyone's thoughts on this right here? Based on the literature, are you being swayed to watch that? Can you make that any bigger? Let's go back to. Essentially, it's when you see a radiolucency in the dentin, just inside, just past the DEJ. Doesn't really sway me, but. It makes me think even more about those ones that are not touching the dentin. Yeah. You know, I, I think if it's there touching the dentin, like 90% of the time I'm doing it more than that. But, you know, then you have the ones that are the ones that we all talk about, like every day. Like we're always talking about these, like all the doctors every day. We're like, you know, what do you think about this? And so I think it makes you think a little bit harder about the ones that are you know, not touching the dentin and, you know, maybe doing fluoride and seeing a recall in a year, I think. Sure. Yeah, I mean, much of this has to do with the patient risk analysis. You know, if you see that um, beaver notch right at the DEJ and it's the only thing they have and they take care of their teeth and they're coming in regularly, probably not going to do it. So what are the different tools that we have? I went over this earlier. We have Canberra, DMFT, just general disease activity, which is somewhat subjective, which is what I think we use most of the time. Cariogram is a program, which the literature actually says is the most accurate at assessing patient's risk. I think this is something similar to what um, the HOW program uses, the Delta, Delta Dental program in assessing uh, risk. It's something similar to that. Dr. Roy. Yep. I also think sometimes if, sorry, I'm hearing it on Zach's computer. <laughs> okay. I think when there's a lesion that I'm questioning, I'll probably watch it unless I then follow up my clinical exam and if there's a clusal caries and I was questioning the mesial distal at that point, I might say, okay, yes, let's treat it with the occlusal. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely other influential factors on deciding what you're going to do. So the presence of occlusal caries may dictate whether or not you do something. Um, yeah, yeah, I like that, Sophia. Can I um, add kind of to that? Um, yep. Sometimes they use, you know, sometimes they may plan multiple uh, class twos on a patient, and I'll use the biggest one as the calibration of that patient's decay so yep. like 
I'll go into the most obvious one. So um, I might plan six of them, but when I get that patient in the chair in the operatory for that restorative appointment on the first day, and we do the most obvious one, it tells me a lot about the other five that I planned that were maybe three of them were really, I don't know, but I still want to figure it out. And so I, I do kind of use the patient as a calibration. I know that seems funny, but yeah. That's a really yeah. good point. Yeah, completely agree. I like that. I also agree. And I actually have that conversation with the patient ahead of time saying that the treatment plan can change up or down. Once we fix the first one, I'll have a lot more information about your mouth, yada, yada kind of thing. Um, and to add to your point, I don't want to say it always is like this, but typically I, if I fix something and it's bigger, it makes me check the exact same surface on the opposite side of the mouth, same tooth, because I feel like it seems to, it's not always a mirror image, but it makes me take a second look sometimes if I'm like surprised by something to reevaluate the radiograph. Definitely. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Is that better? <laughs> yes. Um, something that I've been doing recently, just because I was getting so frustrated in my first year with these, um, is just having a conversation with the patient of, uh, typically when there's like one or two of those 50-50 lesions, I'll just have that conversation with them where if they have a preference on if they want to treat it and just get it done with, or if they don't want to do it unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, like I said, typically if it's only like one or two lesions like this, but um, that way it involves them in the, the decision process. And if it, you know, worst case scenario it comes back to bite you, then at least the patient gave you the go ahead or, you know, didn't want to at that time. So, yeah. Excellent points, guys. Yeah. Yeah, I think both of those we need to build into this, this process. The trans illuminator, like literally every class two that I plan, I use it. And then I put in my note, you know, there's some evidence of radiographic decay. And then when it's trans illuminated, it a lot of times lights up, like you can see it, it's definitely there. And so that's just another kind of safety net for you know, there's evidence of radiographic decay and also using the trans illuminator, seeing that dark shadowing kind of touching the dentin. And that's enough evidence for me to, to do it. And it should for anybody reading that note. So, yeah, love it. I like that. I think we may, may add that to each of the operatories. It's such a good tool. You know, we've, we've had them for years, but we tend to have just a few, they break easily and then we don't get new ones. Um, I'll make sure to have Kelly order some, some of those. Or Mudget, I think you're on the call tonight. Uh, if you can send me an email, maybe we can find uh, some trans illuminators that'll work well for the practice. So there's many different ways of going about this uh, as far as assessing the patient's risk. So here I'm building out what I hope to put into the operatories, and I want to build in uh, the previous comments that you guys had. Maybe we have a flow chart. Love me a good flow chart. You know, the goal here is to have something that stands the test of time. Um, we all graduate with different perspectives and I think having this kind of alignment that's um, from a group of doctors that are leaning into the science I think would be beneficial for, for all. So here we have the lesion status. I like D1 in the moderate section, unlike the ADA's recommendation. Uh, and then we have how do we assess the patient's risk? Again, we just went over several different tools for that. I think for the foreseeable future it's going to be rather subjective. So you're going to have doctors that come in that have that borderline lesion that are going to say it's a lesion and others that don't. And I think uh, the hygienists just have to understand that there's going to be different lenses that we look at as providers. But I think the more that we have these kind of alignment sessions, uh, the more normalized we're going to be. Another interesting thing that they have here, and I, I don't know how much I want to build this into the process, is the lesion active or inactive? You're not going to really tell that for interproximal lesions, but it's an interesting part of the conversation. Uh, here they have, is the lesion active? The gingival status, status. If the lesion is near the gingiva, do you have bleeding or not? What's the tactile fe feeling, so on and so forth. This is more for smooth surface caries, but they put that into the conversation, so I wanted to include it. All right. <clears throat> so there's that original image. You know, it was like 55, 45 in the beginning. It'd be, be interesting to see what that would be now. So let's get normalized. What is normalization? 
essentially, if this was a bell curve on <clears throat> the recommended treatment, mu here being the perfect treatment recommendation, you might have some people that are more aggressive, and you might have some that are too conservative. What we're hoping to do is actually raise the center, get less people away from the extremes, and have it be so that more often than not, doctors agree. So for the following radiographs, these are all patients with low risk profiles. So like Dr. Greenbaum asked earlier, what are the quantifiers? Let's just assume that you didn't have any other information, you just had the radiograph. All right, so let's start here. Let me, we're gonna vote on this one. There's three, activate. All right, would we treat that? Let's start easy. All right, so I think we'd all be in agreement here. Root surface carries. We want to be more aggressive with treatment for sure. Come on. All right, what about 5DO? Hold on, let me uh, click this forward. I'll let everybody know when. Activate. All right, would you treat that? Is SDF an option? <laughs> sorry, sorry. I just thought I'd. Yeah, I, I thought about having, you know, different treatment modalities. Um, it's all good. I know. It's just being silly. Here's my observation for this one. Because of what's next door, I would treat this. If that was alone, I would take an explorer. You know, that's one that you should feel. This is not a. I wouldn't call this a class two lesion. This is root surface caries. Maybe you treat it like a class two, but this might actually be on the distal buckle. You know, we've all seen those where it looks like a class two lesion. And it's actually cervical, like a class five that just kind of superimposes this area. So this is an interesting one, <clears throat> one that I thought we would have a variety of recommendations. Can I say something? Yeah. Um, so when I'm looking at that, and I look at the mesial of four, I can almost see like a, a perfect line going across from the mesial of four to the distal of five. And it almost looks like it's not, not actually there. Like it's just like a, you see what I'm talking about? Are you looking at this right here? Just, yeah, that faint kind of line that goes across perfectly right in that. What would you think that is? like a lip line or, you know, something on the sensor. Or... Yeah. I don't know. Kind of mock, you... mock band effect or cervical yeah, burnout. Yeah. yeah, I mean, typically cervical burnout is beyond the, the tip of the CEJ. You know, you see yeah. it kind of on, on the surface here. Um, again, alone, I don't know what I would do. With that there, I would treat it all day. You know, it, interesting question. <laughs> Funny, this looked a lot more obvious. Let's just skip over that one. That looked more obvious somewhere else. All right, let's just say that you had this and this, and they were both carious upon treatment. Would you treat that? Hold on, let me get to... Sorry, which, which tooth did you just point to? So number 2MO, this what looks like recurrent decay underneath the composite restoration. Oh, 
Yeah, I would agree. That by itself, I know clinicians that would watch it. You know, I, I always like to stick an explorer in there. If it's super smooth, maybe it's just bond or uh, radiolucent bonding agent. Uh, but I would definitely treat that. Uh, one of the one of the doctors had said, you know, maybe this is an abfraction. You know, you definitely can see what looks like interproximal decay uh, in the presence of, of an abfraction. Um, again, I would look at this clinically, and if I saw an abfraction I, and I didn't have a stick, I'm not sure I would treat it uh, as much. Obviously, with this flattening of the occlusal surfaces, he, he might be right. Another interesting observation. All right, so number seven would we treat? I think we're all in agreement, especially when you start to see um, even a pinpoint in the dentin, but when you start to see a halo effect, this is this is probably pretty big. Now what about this one? So this is number eight. So what's interesting here is we don't see any involvement with the dentin. This is one that I think we're gonna get, at least historically, different set of opinions. Come on, give us a hard one, make it sexy. Oh, they're coming, man, they're coming. <laughs> I think this is a hard one. It looks very obvious in the enamel, but according to the ADA, we don't treat that. But I feel like in context, this is really obvious. I would agree. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I agree, and you're going to be able to check it clinically once you prep 12. And you're going to fix the DO anyway. So to me, it seems like a no-brainer to at least plan it, and you can always delete it if, it, if you feel like it's small. But Right. What if this was the only lesion in the mouth? Would anybody not treat it? I don't have a poll for this. If you want to chime in, what would be your rationale? If that was the only, there was nothing else and no restora existing restorations, I might be more apt to watching it. Yeah. But it depends. If there, it, I agree with Sophia's point earlier. If there was anything on the occlusal, it would make me more apt to want to at least go in and kind of get close to the DEJ to see if you can like see that darkness or like Dr. Stalker said, try some other method of seeing. But I, I'd ask the patient what they want to do. Yeah. Let's, also, Chad, as, mu as much as I agree to that, um, let's always build that into the conversation. But if w what would be our recommendation, I think, is, is the goal. Because the patient's going to look for our recommendation. Then we build in what do they want to do. So my recommendation before I put this together would have been I treat this 10 times out of 10. Again, if this was the only lesion in the mouth. Ah, this is a tough one. Also, my understanding is like the pattern of decay, the way it almost funnels in, like we said a carrot shape. With how wide that is near the enameled dentin junction even if i'm not seeing that in the dentin i'm picturing that into the de dentin based on how wide that radiolucency is in the enamel right yeah yeah i mean these are all interesting observations um nothing in the literature talks about that but i i agree with you 100 percent. so as we try to objectify this Again, this is partly for the hygienist to see how much how much goes into this. You know, they see, here's what happens. A hygienist sees the same clinician year over year doing the same thing. That becomes their norm. And then they have a different clinician come in and they look at it differently. That's, that's hard. It's hard to rationalize. And I think what we're showing here tonight is how difficult this decision making actually is sometimes. There's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. I think what I took away from the literature is the literature does support a more conservative approach than what I was taught. And it's definitely moved the needle for me. 
Can I say one other thing? <laughs> um, something that I did not learn at all in school, but I learned from the previous practice that I worked at, which took me a long time to really understand and accept is if you have those patients and you have this like wrapping band of decalcification like around the tooth, those on the radiograph usually look pretty convincing to mm -hmm. want to treat. But then when you prep it, it's just like fully decalcified in the enamel, but nothing in the dentin at all. And then I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. I don't know if I, and then those are really hard to fix on top of that. Cause you mm -hmm. feel like you have to widen your prep so much and it feels aggressive to me for, I don't know. Do you know what I mean? That's so I, I totally know what you mean. If anybody doesn't know what she means, um, God, that's a good point, Elena. So it's, my, it's definitely happened to me, and I feel yes. horrible. Well, and then they usually have it on multiple teeth. So then you're like, well, wait a minute. It's taking me a lot to prep this to get this removed. And then like, am I, should I be removing all of this? So, so we can talk about that part later. But my point is I look for that. Like if I see this wrapping band of decal and it looks small in the x-ray, I watch that a lot. Sure. If I can't see any signs of anything, and I know it's more of a focal point, like what Sophia was kind of saying, like it's more concentrated and I see that spot, I might be more apt to fix it, if that makes sense. Right. But on that one, I agree if that's still, like if that was the only thing in the mouth, I would probably lean towards not touching it. Yeah. That's such a good, important point. <clears throat> Let me see if I can spin this in a different angle just to make sure everybody gets it. We tend to see this uh, with adolescent patients who have very severe plaque buildup on their gums um, before they have delayed, or sorry, before they have passive eruption. So the gum tissue is a little bit higher in their teeth when they're you know, 12, 13 years old. They have very poor plaque control and they have decalcification on the buccal surface, kind of in this, you know, along the margin. And then as time goes on, they're their tissue recedes away, normal recession, passive eruption. But that band of decalcification can show up on the x-ray, just like Elena said. You treat it like a class two and there's no interproximal lesion. And you're like, holy crap. But then you, you see on the buckle of your prep, you're like, oh, I start to see a little bit. And you start chasing it. And the next thing you know, you've blown out half the tooth. So if that's never happened to you, I think what Elena's saying is, she observes the buccal surface sometimes when she thinks that might be what's going on. Um, Carrie's indicator dye on those patients was how I resolved it. Um, you'll often have, when you have that demineralization, especially if it's carious, um, it, it really helps to delineate maybe that's the problem. In which case, I'll go in from the mesial buckle, I'll chase it, and if I can get everything and then restore it, I'm pretty confident that it's probably not an interproximal lesion. Was my description the same as your clinical situation? Yes, I think so. Sometimes it's lingual too. Like okay. it's like, it's like, I know what you're saying as well. And I've done it that way. Um, but the, yeah, the I is, think we're, I think we're on the same page because it's usually like, you know, the kids who are like going through just, I had to their ortho off or exactly. things like that. And you're like, gosh, this is going to be yeah, aggressive to fix all of these. It just seems like it's not, it's like, I get that there's a problem, but it, I had to restore them all seems like way too much. Right. And then, you know, to just add to that is sometimes we go in to fix a problem, but like we can't, you know, or, or you try to fix it, but you don't do like as good a job. Your, your margins not on sound enamel, unless you're going to blow through this entire tooth to try to find sound enamel. Like I agree with that. Right. And so sometimes you're like, oh, is it, is it more harm? Like how many times do we treat recurrent caries with right. composites? I mean, composites are amazing, but in a bad situation, like even the best placed composite just fails miserably too. Right. And you might make a little tiny E2 radiographic caries into a, you know, uh, pulpal involvement, you know, down the line. So right. it is, it's really tough. Yeah, definitely, Jason. All right. What about uh, bring one other thing up? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, um, in this patient, as an example, if we were to not treat that um, 
mesial of uh, 13 there. Yeah, that one. Um, I think I, this is what I mentioned to you the other day, Dr. Roy. Um, if we were to treat everything else, but leave that one as is, so treat the DO, but leave the mesial. And then one year later, comes back for x-rays, and then that one is now clearly into the dentin. Right. Isn't it, isn't, am I correct in saying that insurance has a problem with that because they would cover the DO, but then you would do an MO mm -hmm. and you're treating the occlusal twice within a year. Don't they have an issue yeah. with that? Yeah, they, I... they, they'd probably downgrade. I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer because it depends on the insurance company. Yeah. Um, it is, it does happen. Yeah, and there, there's different time clauses that go into that. Uh, yeah. But I would never make the decision based upon that. I like Correct. what you said. I mean, just just go ahead and and, and watch it. Um, I think, like a few guys have said, I'm going to go in there, and if this is actually less than what I thought, then I'm going to watch this. If it's more than what I thought, I'm going to treat it. That, that's how I would go about this. If this if that was the only tooth in this patient's mouth, I'm treating it ten times out of ten. So what about this guy here? So here we have a rather obvious V-shaped notch, and then a little bit of dentin exposed here. Again, according to the ADA, this is a D1. Let's say this was the only lesion in the mouth. Now we're into the dentin, only lesion in the mouth. Would you treat it? I gotta activate. <coughs> to get the paid version of this particular polling software, $369. Like, yeah, I think I'll pass. <laughs> so we at least have somebody following what the science says. That wasn't me. But I appreciate that perspective because it follows the science. Again, in a patient without anything else. I don't think there's a wrong answer here. Um, Zach, you asked for some tough ones. I think this is a, this is a tough one. Before I read the literature, I would have done this and I would have argued till I was dead that this is one to treat. What about the distal of 19? That I would leave. I would probably put SDF in there and then some Play Doh. Jackets. <laughs> uh, that was a good one. The person who put, I'm, I'm assuming this is one person, if, if you want, well, what's your rationale here? If, you, if you're not comfortable, don't worry about it. The rationale is the science says you watch it. Again, not in this mouth. I'm talking about a mouth that doesn't, doesn't have this kind of carries risk profile. I think that there's another factor too beyond that it's the only one in the mouth and that you feel confident this patient's going to come back in a year right. for radiographs again. That is a very good point. You know, I, I was taught that you can't assume people, you know, what if, this, what if this patient falls on tough times and you just watched it? <laughs> it's a very good point, so. Um, it makes it even harder. And do they have any other restorations already influences my decision as well. Yeah. What about this guy? Do we treat this? <clears throat> Obviously, this was... Whoa, wait, I know her. <laughs> okay, sorry. You know her? Yeah, this uh, I know this I know this patient. Do you? Yeah, didn't we all look at this patient today? <laughs> um, Tess has been putting together bite wings for the greater part of two years. It came out of her um, library of bite wings that I, I've been pulling from for certain things like this. That's hysterical. Okay. It might be. Yeah. I, I, no, it definitely one hundred percent is. They I came have, in last week, believe have, it or not. I have no idea how I would find out who this patient is at this point. That is funny. Um, 
it's not uncommon for young dentists to treatment plan this. That's all, I had to put it in there. So hopefully somebody watching this learns that cervical burnout. It's actually just root, root, root divergence. Uh, let's keep going here. I think we'd all do that one. All right, so this is number 13. Would you do, let me activate it first. Sorry, which one? Are we doing 29 or 30? Uh, 29DO. We're all going to go in tomorrow at work and be questioning every decision. <laughs> I think there's a cavity. <laughs> Let's build in 10, 15 extra minutes in hygiene just because I'm going to be sitting there going, wait, do it, don't do it, do it, don't do it. All right, what about this one? Please, no. <laughs> I feel like I already do that anyway, so. I feel like thickness of, like, how thick it is, right, also plays a role, right? Like, if it's really dark and thick, there's a better chance that it's cavitated. I, I mean, that sways me, like, the thickness of, you know, how radiolucent it really is, I think, plays a role. I don't know if anybody else, that's how they feel. Yeah, that's, that's like what Sophie was saying earlier, I think. Right, So, How, how about this? Um, the, the first two that we did at the beginning were these two lesions. Let's see what our conversation did to our decisions. All right, so this is 14. 100% said no treatment. Let's see what we said in the beginning. So we go all the way to one. <laughs> it was the same image. So before our conversation, more people would, would have restored it. After the conversation, everybody said they would keep it. Could I just put in the confounding fact of, you may have just shown it twice and people just pick differently. <laughs> I think that's totally possible. Say that again. You showed the same image twice. I bet if you showed the same in image to 10 dentists twice, you get 40 answers. Oh, sure. Absolutely. I, yeah, I'm not trying to say you guys are wrong, but what an interesting experiment this was to show even the same population of dentists were off dramatically. Look at the difference here. Two before so this was the first the second slide i showed was i had a i had this right here and 92 percent they would treat it so poll 13 which is what you guys just voted on was a hundred percent no treatment i think i'm sorry 60 40. you know but there's quite a variation there these are the same humans voting on the same things obviously the information we're talking about and presenting and the different opinions that have been going around are normalizing our decision making. Um, it's super interesting. All right. Not done yet. There's Nixon. <clears throat> uh, what about this here? Recurrent decay. I put for doctors only because I, I don't know. Anybody can vote on this. Would you treat that? So I'm talking about the radiolucency underneath this class two composite on number 12 DO.
yeah, I don't know the right answer. You know, neither does the crowd. This here looks rather uniform to me. To me, this looks like bonding agent. This looks more diffuse. Obviously, like every single thing, there's confounding factors that may influence what we do. Does anybody have any strong insight on this? I, I don't. I've removed these before and seen nothing. I've removed it and seen decay all the way to here. I like the. I kind of was taught the same way that you explained. Like the the, the line around where the bonding is is you know if it's really sharp and uniform versus diffuse and uh, I feel like almost every time I remove a composite I see decay in there so. <laughs> So true. Uh, and then just the fact that number 20 is looks like an old composite and it has carries in it, just kind of like, I don't know. That's true. It starts to just make me think, okay, a lot of these composites are maybe compromised. And it, initially, I said no on this, but the more I look at this x-ray, I don't like how the contour of 13 is awful and that could be playing a part here i mean that that's where i would stick an explorer really well between the mesial 13 because i've been in areas where uh, there's a bad contoured restoration and then right next door that actually is decay like nick was saying when you, once you go in there that's a plaque trap area right and i think uh doing the Maybe of 13, and then you can look at just of 12. Yeah, I think that would be the right right play here, for sure. If we didn't have that situation, Transilluminator, I think, would be helpful. <clears throat> Composite tends to look rather gray when there's no bonding underneath, so it's another, another helpful tool. Yeah, again, the tough ones. What about this one? Zach, you wanted a tough one. All right, so this is 16. Activate. Number 19 we're talking about? Yeah, 19 mesial. This right in the center here, that little radiolucency. This is one of those, like Elena was saying, I would look at the buckle. I just have a feeling like this right here is that potential zone of buckle demineralization from a historical period of time when they had plaque buildup. And the contacts a little overlapped. Right. So sometimes that can right, like throw you off a little bit. So I'd obviously prefer to view a second angle for this one. Right. And, and it's overexposed. You know, getting a Getting another image would be the right answer for sure. Anybody else have any comments here? I think we're all in agreement there that we would treat that. So reviewing this again, what I want to do is create a document that we have in all the practices in all the operatories that has some sort of ability to kind of guide us. Patient risk, low, medium, and high. The lesion progression, initial, moderate, and severe. And then what do you do? You know, really, this is the zone right here. It's the D1, kind of the medium, or mo um, sorry, the moderate lesion, the D1, with a medium risk profile. What do you do? you treat it or not this is the zone where I think we're gonna have the most disagreement so let's now bring in the risk forget the rest of the image this is the only thing that you see patients at low risk they have no other decay in their mouth would you treat this
for those who can't see, there's a little bit of radiolucency right there. In school, I was taught if you see even the smallest bit here, you treat it, even at low risk. All right, now let's bring up the risk. Now the patient's moderate risk. Okay, go ahead and vote. <coughs> According to the chart that we just looked at, the recommendation here would be to watch it for six months. But then again, like Sophia said, what if the patient doesn't come back? And then at six months, are we, we're not going to take another image, right? So we're going to look at this old image and then just kind of get a clinical feel and transilluminate. It's probably another good idea, but um, yeah, it's not a bad idea, but just trying to think through that process. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of resources to bring a patient back and having a doctor come in to, to look at this when nine times out of 10 is probably not gonna be any different. But, you know, these are tools that we have available to us. And then that same lesion in a patient with high risk. Yeah, these are in interesting observations. You know, at least we, we had kind of a general trend when we brought in the risk profile. We went from more conservative to more aggressive as a group. <clears throat> what about this? We should be selling this stuff like Kool-Aid out of Kool-Aid, Stan. Because in reality, how do we modify the risk? How many fluoride trades have we made for patients? In reality, I think we should be doing this all of the time. I don't do it as much as I should, so I'm not preaching from the pulpit uh, or the ivory tower, but you know, through this process, I think what I've learned is if we're gonna be more conservative, delaying and having the patient continue doing what they're doing is not really good treatment. Getting them something like this, I think would be helpful. And with today's technology, with the iTero scan, you know, we should be, do, be able to do this rather, rather easily. Anybody have any thoughts on, you know, one, giving this? I think we all know, make sure the patients don't rinse after. I don't know if everybody knows this. I've been surprised. I've been surprised at how many people don't know this. Even regular toothpaste, the directions never say rinse after brushing your teeth. That might be obvious to everybody, but I, I've definitely had this conversation over the years and been surprised how many people like, no, regular toothpaste, it says to rinse. Um, most toothpastes, toothpaste, as far as I know, don't. The important point is if you're applying this, this is a topical toothpaste that's meant to stay. Um, Dr. Greenbaum and I did a um lecture with through the mda i think it was january i think with um dr nate lawson um he had made a point of changing the verbiage from watching or monitoring a lesion to treating non-surgically with clincro trays what have you i like that. Um, feel like that's a really would be a very hard change to make just because it's so much easier to you know, write and say, watch or monitor, but I feel like that would be a great thing to try to change. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I'm going to add that to my notes uh, from this. Um, Brian Novi 
Um, I don't know if anybody's ever seen him talk. He, he talks in this world about this kind of stuff a lot. Carries management. Um, he spoke at the NBA several years ago. And uh, he brought up the good point. What is a watch? <laughs> it's either a cavity or it's not. Um, I think tonight we proved the fact that sometimes watching something is important. But, uh, you know, I, I, I like that particular phraseology, which is non-surgical treatment. L let's charge the patient something, you know, for our professional opinion. Because I think not treating the patient, even though you're not treating them, they should be billed for that expertise and that decision making. So I, I, I like that approach. You know, we can charge $20 for a tube of Prevident. But if 10 dentists were going to, or out of 10 dentists, if nine of them were going to treat something and you were the one that took the conservative approach and that lesion never got any more, you're going to get paid the least, which is $20 for ClinPro. Shouldn't you get paid the most? It's an interesting thought. The fluoride, like testing fluoride in the water is also a big one. The wells, yep. stuff like that. Yep. I think water in general is like the, one of the bigger bigger ones you know just drinking water like diet counseling you know um but making sure that if they are drinking water <clears throat> especially the little a lot of kids things like that you know people have no idea if there's fluoride in their water in their wells and stuff and we have the kits too We've, yeah. i've done it with amy and just a couple times great what about <clears throat> salivary testing it's a very interesting conversation and I think we could probably have an hour, hour and a half, two hour talk on that alone. Um, Chantel is trained on how to do that. Uh, we don't do bio, uh, bacterial testing, so we don't measure for the levels of strep mutans. Those kits do exist. <clears throat> um, the literature is pretty clear that that's not super helpful. Everybody has strep mutans. Um, with that said, measuring for pH, buffering capacity, stimulated salivary flow, you know, all of those factors is something we have the capacity to do. You know, I, <clears throat> I've recommended that for Sjogren's patients, um, patients on head and neck cancer radiation, so on and so forth. But it's, you know, it's part of the practice that I think it's part, it's a part of everyday practice I think we should do more of because here we are looking at lesions and we're waiting for them to get bigger to determine whether we're going to do something or not. When in reality, the environment is what's going to influence whether that progresses or not. And why don't we measure the environment? So I wholeheartedly agree that that's probably more of the answer than, than what we discussed tonight. Uh, how do we prevent these lesions from ever showing up on the radiographs? So it's a, it's an important point that we will definitely talk about moving forward. So again, I'm going to try to make a document if anybody has any thoughts, is this too busy? Do we include the active versus inactive carious lesions for class twos? Do we like this particular breakdown of um, the classification for interproximal lesions? How do we build in the patient risk? So the goal here is to have an objective process on one piece of paper. So I'd love everybody's help if you guys have any thoughts on how we can continue to work on this for the sanity of the hygienists, for the comfort of the doctors when they're going in the operatories to not feel like they're selecting the wrong answer. Um, at the end of the day, I think we proved tonight that this is a rather ambiguous, amorphous moving object. Uh, but I think we normalized it tonight and I think we proved it through the polls. So if you have any thoughts here, please let me know. There's the two kids, beautiful picture taken last week. Um, I had a bunch of other images, but, you know, we're, we're approaching 9 o'clock. Let's see if there was one here. I put this one here. This is overexposed, you know, so be okay asking the hygienist to retake or the assistant to retake the image if it's overexposed. Yeah, we'll save this for another day. Things underneath crowns. All right, so in the future, we're going to do the same kind of project for occlusal caries diagnosis. If you would like your CE credits, uh, please email julie at soccerdentistry.com. And of course, a copy of this video will be posted on the Nikkei YouTube channel. And let's end with...
Anybody have any last minute comments? Thank you. Thank you. I always promised myself that if I ever decided to teach, that I would never show pictures of my kids. Um, now I get it, now that I have kids. So on that note, I feel like this was very fruitful uh, for the hygienists in the crowd. Um, please know that every doctor here is probably more confused than when we started this. Just cut us some slack as we start to, to normalize this moving forward. Um, but I have no doubt the literature will get better and better as time goes on on this particular topic. And uh, let's get better about prevention. Let's do some more fluoride trays, more uh, ClinPro. Uh, Amy and Mudget, if you guys wanna make sure that we have this stuff fully stocked, I have no doubt that we're gonna start to do more and more of it. Um, we don't need to wait till the patient has severe caries to start putting this stuff out. You can give it to a patient that has one incipient lesion that you want to reverse. I think that's perfectly acceptable, and I think we all agree to that. Um, um, real quick, can you just, just uh, uh, say, say what the instructions, instructions are for fluoride trays? trays. Um, I, I, I have no science to back this up. This is what I tell patients. If you can wear them throughout the night, great. Um, it protects the teeth. If it doesn't cause any TMD problems, why not? Uh, but I say a minimum of an hour after you eat, brush your teeth, put the fluoride in, watch your favorite show, Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy, take it out, um, then you're good. I'm sure we all have different opinions on this, but I think the exposure time of direct topical application is such a drastic difference than not doing anything that it's going to tilt the scales of the chemistry in their mouth in the right direction. I think, I think we, we do, do uh, uh, chat. I think, I think we, we have, have um, a, document, a document, and I've, and I've given, given it to a patient at our, at our office, office. So, so we can, we can look, look in the in shared, shared doc. doc. It's, it's, it's somewhere. It's somewhere. Yeah, yeah, it's in the, in the shared, shared doc. doc. I, think I think it says, it says that minimum, minimum 20, 20 minutes. minutes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and are we, and, and Dr. Roy, maybe you can just chime in on this, but we just give them ClinPro and tell them to use that. I mean, I think, I think that's, that's fine, fine, but I know, I know there, there are gels, gels too, too, like on that picture, picture that you had, had for fluoride trays. trays there's like an actual fluoride tray gel, gel, like a like prevalent gel. gel. And I don't, and know, I don't if know if we should go, go as far as to then, then prescribe, prescribe that. that or... Let's have a whole other conversation yeah. Yeah. at some point um, on that topic alone, because I, I, I really think that's where the focus needs to be. Sure, sure. Rather than banging our heads, should we treat it, not treat it? Why don't we pour a lot of attention and focus on how to prevent it? Um, and I think we should get compensated for it too. I, I think the more I talk about this, the more I think we need to build this in. And the HAL program has a really good reimbursement programs for stuff like this. Um, we're leaving fluoride varnishes on the table for patients all day long. You know, the HAL program it really kind of builds this into the process because it's, the literature is very clear. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good night, everybody. Don't forget to sing Twinkle Night. Twinkle Little Star. See you all in the morning. morning. <laughs> Later.